7 o'clock on the Tuesday night. I guess we're doing this again. It's Mission Log Live. I'm Ken Ray. And I'm John Champion. And you, yes, you, are the reason that we're here. This is the show where we get together with you, our Star Trek pals, and we talk about Trek and other things, whatever's on your mind. Now, I'm not so good at mind reading, so you've got to meet us halfway there. Give us a shout. There are a few ways to do that. You can click on the link to our Zoom meeting, or you can use the one tap from your smartphone. You can also call me. Don't be afraid. You can call me. Maybe it's late, but just call me. 646-558-8656. That number again, 646-558-8656. Then enter the meeting code that you'll find in the show description and the comments. Then you are on with us. Ken, I, I saw you shaking your head when I was uh, given the, the call out to call. Okay, well, help me. What song is that? Because I know it's a song because that's what we do, but what is it? Uh, call Me by the Mike Flowers Quartet. Oh, Call Me. See, because the Call yeah. Me I know would have been the one, you know, Call Me, I'm you were Home. Thinking, you, know? you were thinking Blondie. Call Me. I was thinking Blondie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But I, I, You know, next week an American Gigolo reference. That's, that's, that's fine. In addition to the one you just did. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Hey, uh, joining us this week, it's Kevin Dilmore. He who writes things that are Star Trek and who makes things that are also Star Trek. He can has all the track. Just ask him. Uh, if you have a question for us or for Kevin or a burning question about the nature of the universe that we can't possibly begin to answer, uh, 646-558-8656 is the phone number to call, 646-558-8656. Then you enter the meeting code that you'll find in the show description and the comments, or you can join our Zoom meeting or use the one tap from your smartphone. Uh, thank you for joining us live either on facebook.com slash missionlogpod or at YouTube. Uh, that is youtube.com slash Roddenberry Prod, I believe it is. Now, if you're picking up just the audio stream, thank you very much for doing that too. Basically, wherever you are, from wherever we are, a hearty thanks. Hey, uh, we got some stuff coming up, not just for tonight's show, but then uh, other stuff other times. Oh, John, won't you please tell people what some of that is? I would be thrilled to. Actually, even before I get to that, I, I do want to say hi to our Trek pals who are there in the Facebook live chat. There's Wes, there's Peter, there's Carlos, there's David. Uh, David says, burning question, exactly how fast are we moving in the universe, of course? And the only way that I could possibly answer that is to run the lyrics through my head of the, uh, the universe song from uh, Monty Python and the Meaning of Life. Um, I believe that uh, moving through the universe 16,000 miles a second, so they reckon. We'll check on that. We'll check on the math. We'll ask Eric Idle. Uh, Jocelyn's there. Donna, uh, uh, Alan, Ian, Myra, Erica. So many people joining us. Great to see you all. Oh, and look, there's T.L. Coco joining us live tonight. Great to see you, Lieutenant J. So, Ken, as you mentioned, there's a lot coming up. Well, on the live show, yes, we always like to sprinkle in a guest or two, but we also love to hear from you. Now, we want you to call in when we have a guest like Kevin tonight, but we are also planning some more open Q&A shows as we wrap up the season. And then as we get closer to the end of the year, well, we have some Star Trek Discovery mini episodes to look forward to. There was a teaser image just came out the other day. Did you see that, Ken? It was uh, Rain Wilson and uh, two people painted green. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that they were Orion's. And that feels like a safe assumption. I didn't see that yeah. teaser episode, by the way, and I felt... Uh... I felt properly teased. It's weird, though, because you're still looking at like 15 episodes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, I think they said there would be, we were counting on four mini episodes. Right, between, right. Uh, like in the fall and toward the end of the year. Then in early 2019, the, the actual season of uh, so, 15 episodes. Yeah. So then is he doing one of the mini episodes or is he going to be in one of the episodes for next season? Or do we know for certain? Yeah, he's in one of the mini episodes. That's what they were uh, working on. That's what they were teasing. So, yeah. Yeah. okay. So, a little new trek to look forward to as I get toward the end of the year. Uh, but in any case, you know where to find us, uh, like you should every Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, facebook.com slash mission log pod or at youtube.com slash Roddenberry prod. What else can more things coming up? More things. Well, if one reality is not enough for you, and I know that can be the case for a lot of people, there's also the virtual reality into which we go. Uh, last week, we had a really fun trivia uh, trivia challenge. It was the first of three rounds of trivia culminating at the end of the year with a gigantic trivia 
uh, Palooza or something. I don't know. So anyway, that was last Thursday. Uh, nothing this week for us personally at the Nexus in uh, Sansar, the Roddenberry Nexus in Sansar. But next Thursday, uh, we have uh, Star Trek luminary Doug Drexler. He's actually going to be taking a tour around the Star Trek Nexus, pointing out stuff that he likes, pointing out stuff, I don't know, uh, things that he's got, uh, basically bringing his own color. And you know he's a colorful guy. So bringing some of his own views uh, to some of the stuff that we're seeing there. It's a great opportunity to get in there, not only just you know hang out with, uh, I don't know who uh, from Rottenberry is actually going to be in the Nexus that night, but I do know uh, some of us will be, and of course Doug will be there as well. So that is uh, Thursday, September 27th is when that'll be uh, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, because we kind of like this time, we're going to stick to it. And then a couple of Thursdays later, on October the 11th, you can go inside Star Trek with, uh, oh, golly, you got your John Champion, you got your Ken Ray, and you got your Rod Roddenberry. Inside Star Trek is an album that uh, Gene Roddenberry recorded uh, sort of in, the be- in between times, between when Star Trek was off the air and when Star Trek The Motion Picture came out. You're looking at early to mid-70s. Uh, it's kind of a weird album. We're not going to do the whole album, but... John and Rod and I are each going to pick out a couple of tracks that we like. We're going to play them for people there in the Nexus. And then uh, hopefully have a discussion. I don't want so it to it, be... It's, it's, it's Gene Roddenberry Jazz Odyssey. It's, <laughs> right. Yeah. He wrote this. Yes. Um, and, I mean, I don't want it to be a thing where, the, okay, so here's the track I like and here's why I like the track. I want to find a track that I like, I want to play it for everybody, and then hopefully we can talk about, you know that's the silliest thing I ever heard, or that's mind blowing or, you know, whatever. So that'll be on the 11th of October again, uh, 7 PM Pacific, 10 PM Eastern. And then the trivia challenge continues again, Thursday, the 25th of October will be round two. And then, uh, gosh, sometime in November is round three and you'll never guess what happens in, uh, in December. Uh, that's when we wrap that up. Uh, by the way, don't do me a favor. I'm not, I don't want to give you homework. But if you're going to join us on any of the VR stuff, be sure to go to sansar.com and sign up for your account first because there's no cost there. It's not difficult at all. But if you do want to go into Sansar, you do have to have an account. They don't ask for a lot of information. I don't know that I've ever gotten any promotional email from them, so they don't spam you a lot. Uh, If you're running Windows 7 or later, or if you have a Mac and can run Windows on the boot camp side, Windows 7 or later, you can either do the 2D thing where you're just sitting there, you know, sort of going through the browser, or if you have an Oculus Rift or an HTC Vive, then you can sort of be in that virtual space or virtually be in that virtual space with us. So a few different ways to access it. And our hope is that we're able to gather people like we do here or like we do in Vegas during a convention or at any other convention. Hopefully we get people together and we talk about some really cool, really interesting Star Trek stuff. So sansar.com to set up your account and then every other Thursday night in the Nexus uh, for the foreseeable future. And of course that's always there for people to check out as well. So there's that. Yeah. Hey, and uh, congrats to ascertain who won the uh, trivia challenge last week and he will move on to the, uh, the final round in December. And while I'm giving more shout outs, uh, John Cooley, Lisa, uh, uh, Kim, Casey Shasky. What up Casey? Uh, Joyce, uh, Earl, and then uh, Erica. Erica says, thanks for calling me out. Dream realized. Isn't that nice? That's, uh, I'm so glad we could make a dream be a reality for you. Erica, who's actually sporting the top fan tag, uh, as, as I see a few of these out there happening. And uh, there's Steve Sheridan saying hi to us as well. So uh, very nice to see everybody there. Uh, Ken, we're, we're just seconds away from introducing our guest, but we like to check in with the poll. Uh, last week, we asked a poll question, as we do every week, and we asked you, uh, because we had Ben Robinson, the Star Trek expert on a guy who knows a thing or two about Star Trek. So we asked you, what, what, what's, what do you grok? Is it the in front of the camera stuff? Is it behind the scenes stuff? 45% of you said in front of the camera, 55% of you said behind the scenes. You could interpret that question however you want. Would you rather work in front of the camera? Would you rather work behind the scenes? Or as a fan, what do you dig? Is it just watching the shows or is it learning about all the, the tips, the tricks, and, and all, all the effort that it took to put it on screen? But a, a, a slim majority of you said you really get into the behind the scenes stuff of Star Trek. I thought that was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Now, uh, you, as you pointed out, there are a couple of different ways that people could have taken that question. Today, 
Uh, there are not a couple of different ways that you can take this question. This is basically a, not even a math question, but a quantity question. Uh, yes, it's probably too early to be thinking about Christmas, except as the song goes, we need a little Christmas or something. The question we have today is how much geek is on your Christmas tree? Now, because it's a either or sort of thing, the question we have is, is it less than a quarter of your tree is geek or more than a quarter of your tree is geek? I will tell you honestly, my intent around Christmas was to never have any geek on my tree. And then people find out you like things. Like they find out you like Star Wars, they find out you like Star Trek. And all of a sudden, a significant portion of my Christmas tree uh, is all kinds of geek stuff, even though I've never bought a single geek ornament, I don't think. So the question we have, uh, how much of your tree, or how much geek, excuse me, is on your Christmas tree? Less than a quarter or more than a quarter? Right now, less than a quarter is at 65%. More than a quarter is 35%. And I actually, I kind of want to see uh, both of those trees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a little surprised. I, I think I, I started out with uh, an unintentionally geek tree, you know, mm -hmm. just sort of a normal tree. And then, like you said, an ornament or two comes in. You got your Spock, you got your Enterprise. And before you know it, you, you got the Tribble ornament. You got all that stuff. I, I even, I, I mix my Star Wars and my Star Trek. I even have, I believe, a Back to the Future ornament. I even believe that I have the uh, the Bandits Trans Am on there. Just, just hanging really? out. Yeah. See, that's, yeah. Not, that's not geek, though. That's just cool. It is. I, it is. I think, anyway. Yeah. You've also got a, uh, you've got a Felt Wesley. I do. <laughs> you know, I don't know somebody, where you got that. I don't know how you got said, that. I felt Wesley. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Man, so why are we talking about Christmas ornaments anyway? I, I, probably because of tonight's guest. If you've been to a major convention in the past few years, you've seen Kevin Dilmore there. And even if you don't know him by sight, uh, you're more than likely very familiar with his work. His name is all over Star Trek novels and short stories like Starfleet Corps of Engineers, often paired up with Dayton Ward. And if you don't know Kevin that way, you might have some of his other work in your home hanging from your tree, maybe. You know, those cool Star Trek keepsake ornaments that Hallmark keeps making year after year after year. Uh, Kevin Dilmore had a hand in those. So please, a hand, won't you, for Mr. Kevin Dilmore. Well, thank you very much. It's a lot of fun to be here. And I, I, I don't look geeky at all in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show, Dave. Uh, oh, Dave. there it is. My yeah, God. Get it out of the way front, oh. John. Get it out of the way right up front. See, that, that's the worst, though. We, we put his name in the opening because I, I feel like we I, I we mentioned your name when we had Dayton on the show. That's just <laughs> uh, far for the chorus. You know, it's uh, we, we, you know, we uh, are, uh, you know, brothers from different mothers. Uh, it, it absolutely doesn't throw me off. And it was funny because uh, when I was on the panel at, uh, um, uh, Star Trek um, Vegas this year. Uh, they reported Star Trek.com covered the panel and said that Dayton was the one on the panel. So people started tweeting him that maybe he's in Vegas and was lying about it, you know, <laughs> and uh, because because we would never have imagined that Star Trek.com made a mistake. No, never, so. never. Well, hey, I mean, look, you, you only get to the point where you've done uh, what can like 300 plus podcasts and uh, you say your name on each show and people still get the name wrong. So, you know, you, yeah. your name is only printed multiple thousands and thousands of times on books and articles and everything. But let's uh, let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning here. I want you to take us uh, kind of quickly through your Trek fandom, uh, just as oh. uh, just as a dude, just as a guy growing up watching Star Trek. Give us a little taste of that. And then what sure. led you to have a foot in the professional Trek world? Sure. Well, um, in uh, September of 1973, when I was a strapping nine-year-old, I absolutely <laughs> tuned in to the first broadcast of, uh, of the Filmation Star Trek series, which just celebrated its 45th anniversary earlier in the month. So uh, that's uh, very cool for me. It's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I got the information from my across-the-street neighbor that Hey, moron, you know, that used to be a real live TV show. And I said, what? And so he started inviting me over to his place after school and we watched the original series. I was unaware um, that uh, it was really a thing. He had the uh, AMT model kits. He even had the, uh, and, I, and I love knowing, I love knowing that Cooley's out there because I'm going to hit him with like five or six different things. <laughs> Get your notepad out, John. 
uh, uh, he had the uh, uh, windbreaker that you could send away for from AMT, and we would, um, I would, he, his mom had one, and he had one, and I could sometimes, I'd get to borrow one of them, and we'd play landing party. Uh, we'd go out, and uh, in different parts of this house was, so you didn't think I'd go this deep, but this Man, is what I do. You, um, your nerd level just, I, I mean, I, I know you as a guy who is deeply steeped in track, but your, your nerd level just oh, expanded yeah. Even yeah, beyond my imagination. There's a reason I have two ex-wives, sir. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, um, but, but that was absolutely what uh, what brought me into it. Um, the first uh, um, uh, purchase I remember making through uh, Scholastic Book Club was the uh, Alan Dean Foster Star Trek Log 1. Uh, I also uh, purchased the poster that uh, um, they, um, Scholastic made out of the uh, cover for uh, Star Trek IV, the Blish book. Uh, it had uh, the blue planet with the Enterprise over it and stuff. And, and uh, it was a, uh, a poster that had been lost to me until uh, Dayton, fast forward, gave it, tracked it down on eBay and gave it to me for Christmas. It's now hanging in my office at Hallmark. So wow. very meaningful Star Trek gift. But uh, so that was, uh, you know, I mean, I, I watched the original series. I watched all the things as uh, as it went forward in about 2007 was that right i'm trying to remember i uh, contacted dan madsen because i was an avid reader of star trek communicator i was working as a uh, newspaper reporter at the time and pitched him the idea for a story um, based on a uh, pocketbooks novel called The Joy Machine. Uh, James Gunn had uh, written a novelization of Theodore Sturgeon's script that was unproduced. And I had Professor Gunn as a fiction writing teacher at KU. So I very much wanted to, I thought I had the inside track on interviewing him. You know, I wrote this pitch. I faxed it to Dan because that's what we had back in those days, kids. <laughs> and he faxed me back this, you know how it used to be where you'd have like, a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox where like little dust particles would become these blobs. Eyes would kind of, you know, reach up and grab the dot. And, yeah. It's just, it was right. that. It basically said shove Beautiful. off. So we have <laughs> enough contributors. We have enough, we have people just falling out of trees to write for us, pal. Uh, so I thought, oh, okay, so that was cool. Uh, there was a convention in Kansas city that uh, Chase Masterson was a guest at. And I also discovered that she was going to be a guest at a second Kansas City Convention just months away. So I thought maybe she had a KC connection. I reached out to her. She didn't, but she was open to being interviewed when she was at this second convention. So I spoke with her. It was on Valentine's Day. I want to say maybe in 2007 and um, uh, wrote up a story, uh, 25, 2600 words, however many it was uh, from that interview, faxed it to Dan and said, if you're interested, this is yours. If I don't hear from you in a week, I assume that you're not interested, but thank you very much for the audition. An hour later, he's on the phone to me and he said, I want it and what else do you have? And that was what started me in, uh, in, in, in Star Trek as a professional. Um, Dan Madsen and Larry Nemechek um, both uh, gave me uh, the opportunities to write for the magazine. Through that, I uh, met John Ordover, and um, when he called me to ask if I wanted to break the news that um, Starfleet Corps of Engineers was going to be a, a digital-only offering for pocketbooks uh, that was part of the promotion for Microsoft's ebook reader. This was back in like 1999 or 2000, I think, that we were talking about it. Um, in the course of interviewing him for the story about the concept of Starfleet Corps of Engineers, I pitched a story. Uh, he said, well, we're looking for things that are a little bit like, uh, you know, uh, um, they, they're technical, technically um, fueled plots, but it's not techno babble. It's this, that, and the other. It's them going out and doing things that where technology is the adventure kind of stuff. Um, and I said, oh, you mean like if somebody decided they wanted to, I don't know, uh, pull the Defiant out of Interface? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what we're looking for. <laughs> and I said, uh, so can I pitch that? And he said, sure, that sounds great. And, uh, hung up from him immediately called Dayton. And I said, I've got myself in a world of crap, uh, and I need you to help bail me out. And so that's, that's what started our fiction writing, uh, uh, duo. And, uh, and I, have written Star Trek only rarely uh, by myself. Um, in fact, I think uh, maybe once, um, because that to me the 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 fun of it is breaking the story and breaking it down. I just I just don't feel like I'd want to do it without him. 
669-900-6833 is the phone number to call, 669-900-6833. Or, of course, you can uh, uh, click the uh, join our Zoom meeting or use the one tap from your smartphone. Uh, do all that stuff because you know how to get in touch with us. And I hope you will. I got a question. I want to go all the way back to the very beginning of, of your entry into track. On the one hand, it's kind of strange to me that your first introduction would have been the cartoon because they just sort of start the cartoon without any kind of introduction. But then I remember that's how they started the man trap as well. We didn't know who Kirk was. We didn't know who Spock was. We didn't know who anybody was. We're just like in the middle of this story all of a sudden. These guys are old friends and here's this guy's ex-girlfriend. And why do I care? Because who's that guy to begin with? What, what was your, I mean, is it like you're nine and it's a cartoon and then after this comes you know, Scooby and Scrappy-Doo? I mean, do you remember what your take on Star Trek was seeing the animated series when you first saw it? I had, um, uh, I was blessed with a, uh, with a mom who uh, helped me learn how to read when I was two. And I was a fairly voracious comic book reader and I'm sure that it was ads for um for that cartoon that that was you know or at least even just the visuals that drew me into it but my earliest memories of cartoons um were always uh, adventurous i loved johnny quest back in the day um uh, all of the hanna barbera action heroes space ghost and herculoids and galaxy trio and uh um, frankenstein jr and and you know the uh, birdman all that stuff was really appealing to me and uh this what I think it was about Star Trek was that I, I really had to kind of think about it. If I, and I used to be pretty good at uh, a lot of my animated uh, trivia. So uh, please correct me. Uh, Beyond the farthest star, I think was the first aired episode. Does that sound correct? That is correct. Yeah. And, um, and it, and it actually is for, for a 22 minute cartoon in 1973, it's fairly hard science fiction. And I was just fascinated by it. I mean, there really was just, I mean, that episode was very much the sense of Star Trek exploration. I mean, if you go back into uh, um, uh, and, and just watch that, clear your head and watch that 22 minute episode, and you're going to see a number of things that are true, um, you know, icons of what makes Star Trek Star Trek present in that episode we should not be surprised because dc fontana was involved as a story editor she was very interested in hiring people who um, had familiarity with not just star trek but good writing uh she by, by sheer uh coincidence was able to hire people who might have been working on other projects because there was a tv strike at the time but if you were in the union uh writing for animated shows didn't apply so they, it was a way for her to give work to people who weren't able to get work and a way for us to get master storytellers working on it on a cartoon series um, that, uh, you know, by all other accounts, shouldn't have been any better than Gilligan's Planet. <laughs> <laughs> you actually, I mean, you just hit on something that we talked about a lot when we covered the animated series. I mean, one of the things that was amazing to me is what uh, a TOS episode was maybe 52 minutes before commercials. And a lot of times you felt a lot of those 52 minutes, the animated series, you got 22 minutes to get in and get out and tell an amazing story. And you had amazing storytellers who had to cut the fat. I mean, they oh, would, they absolutely. would, I mean, not every single episode is a winner, but um, yeah, it, it almost sounds like you're trying to pitch us on the animated series. And I say magics of Magus two is one of the best episodes of star Trek ever. Yeah, that's Period. that is a fantastic one. And so, yeah. and, you know, and I I will rewatch them. And uh, when I was a kid, I was fascinated by the jihad, um, the idea of all these aliens. I mean, Kirk and Spock basically, uh, as uh, as humans, were outnumbered by you know the rest of the cast. And there was just something about that that really fascinated me. And uh, and imagine that cartoon, or that that story. Um, where would you get the budget? to tell that story, you know, on, uh, you know, in a uh, traditional live action show. And that's one that roped me in when, when I was a kid, I really, really connected with it. And, and as a nine-year-old, uh, you didn't know what green memories were. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> had, had to grow up a little bit to figure out what the, uh, context was there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, don't 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 ruin my childhood. Don't, don't soil this, please. You know? <laughs> By the way, uh, Carlos says uh, space nuts greater than Gilligan's planet. 
Hmm. Far Out Space Nuts. Well, yeah. okay, remember that Gilligan's Planet was animated and Far Out Space Nuts, if I remember correctly, was live action. Live action, Chuck McCann, uh, Bob Denver, produced, of course, by Sid and Marty Croft. I mean, it yes. was an ambitious show. And like every Sid and Marty Croft show, lasts about one season. And you go, yeah. what was that? And then yeah. they just Although, now, I will one. say, you know, I mean, you know, Bugaloo's uh, may have been uh, the greatest Sid and Marty Croft effort, but I also would put put the, the, would put this. I would imagine that uh, um, uh, the the work of filmation done under the influence of psychotropic drugs versus the work of Sid and Marty Croft. Mm. I, mm. I, you know, I rest my case. Yeah. <laughs> nice. You know, I mean, you know, although although uh, Sid and Marty Croft did some amazing casting, Charles Nelson Riley, he was a genius. Okay, look, I, I know that this is completely off track of what we normally talk about, but uh, be surprised, I'm your look, guest. Yeah, it, it's our show, and we can talk about whatever you want. There is a documentary that is the uh, the Charles Nelson Riley one man show called Life of Riley, absolutely captivating. The man was a genius. And if, yes. if all you know is him on uh, Lidsville, prepare to have your mind blown. He, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, amazing. Amazing yes. one man yes. show. I highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, it, it's funny. Fan. Like uh, our entire chat now is turning into Bugaloos, Lidsville, HR Puff and stuff, Sigmund and the Sea Mods. They're just naming all of them. They're so just rattling them all off. Pretty yeah. great. Pretty great. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the, and the funny thing is that, uh, you know, there's a great uh, amount of television history involved with, uh, you know, the, the people who were the creators of those shows of the or the, uh, you know, the talent behind those shows. I mean, wasn't Felix Silla um, Sigmund? He was. Absolutely. I mean, yep. you know, so, I mean, you know, when you look at people who have been involved in the shows that we all grew up in, everything is connected. And uh, and, and so you can there's probably you know star trek people involved in however many of those episodes i mean you know uh, uh ted cassidy um voiced uh you know stuff for hanna barbera and then went on to uh you know to to be rock right right so there absolutely you have it. can can steer us back in the right direction please here. please yeah. well i'll see what i can do <laughs> let me remind people how they can get in touch with this first of all six six nine nine hundred six eight three three nope that's i don't even know what that is six four six five five eight eight six five six is the phone number to call six four six five five eight eight six five six uh there are a few numbers for which i give out um shows they, they, they should all connect as long that. as you, as long as you hit the meeting code, then. Uh, right. Then oh, but by the way, I know that I just asked you to steer us back on track. Donna says, whoa, Tweaky was Sigmund. Yes. Wait for that on our Buck Rogers in the 25th century podcast coming in 2073. <laughs> I have no I'll idea what any of you people in. are talking about. <laughs> I, I recognize like every other word you guys are saying at this point. Really quickly, <laughs> you can also do uh, the video thing uh, that we do, which is, of course, uh, go to our Zoom meeting or use the one top from your smartphone. That is, in fact, what Kim has done. Kim is, uh, is joining us uh, by video phone. Oh, cool. Oh, oh no, we Kim lost was her. joining us, and now we've lost. Okay, well. Tell you what we're going to do. I hear that uh, Kim is going to be joining us in a second. Tell you what, John, why don't we do a, a bit of business and then uh, we'll see if we can get Kim back and we'll roll right through. By the way, Earl, we know you're there. Uh, uh, Cooley? Uh, hmm, I don't know. Somebody is Sounds here as well, like so we'll name. get to them. Yeah. And of course, we will get to you. 646-558-8656. Could be the phone number. 646-558-8656. Uh, in the meantime, though, we do, have a, we do want to remind people uh, where to go to spend their money. Yes, so uh, that place where art and commerce bump their heads, we would like to remind you about our shop conveniently located at missionlogpodcast.com. What you do is you go there in your web browser and then you look in the upper right-hand corner and you click on shop because what we have done is we've taken the best of our classic collection and then some amazing new designs by our friend Carl Huber and we throw them all in there on all kinds of merchandise. Uh, Ken, what kind of designs might one find if we're, no. one were to go to the Mission Log shop? Well, there's Isolinear John and Ken. That's you and me on a chip. Uh, carbon chauvinism with a Da Vinci twist. And yes, uh, the Silicon supporters are there as well. I know we don't have video of that, but we need to update that video soon so we can show uh, some of the new stuff that's going on. Uh, your favorite lieutenant and mine, Lieutenant J, is in the house and can be on your shirt, can be on your tapestry, can be on your mug, can be wherever you want Lieutenant J to be. And isn't that the world we all want to live in? 
Uh, bonk, bonk on the head since 1966. Nova Squadron is represented. And we got some old favorites. We've got the Ditalics Mining Corporation. Uh, you can be cool as Kirk if you want to. Ethos, pathos, and logos can be right there. Right where? Well, on all kinds of things. Like uh, I know I just named them, John, but I feel like I stepped on your line. So so what kinds of things could people get these uh, these things on? Oh, uh, uh, fidget spinners, uh, photo no. candles. No. Uh, no uh, car mats. <laughs> No, no, no. Okay, coming to the time. For, for the time being, T-shirts, mugs, right, stickers, right. notebooks, wait for it, drum roll, please, tapestries. Tapestries, yes. yeah. Tons of stuff to check out and make your own truly unique Trekish gear. Get yours today at missionlogpodcast.com. Just click on shop and uh, just, uh, just a world of exciting Mission Log merchandise for you there. So remember to call in at 646-558-8656. We have all these nice people waiting to uh, to chat with us, to chat with you, to chat with our guest, Kevin. Uh, who are we going to first? I think we've got, uh, do we have Kim back? Or are we going to Earl? Um, there actually looks to be nothing queued up right now. So, so why don't we say something fun to Kevin? Oh, hey, Kevin. <laughs> what up, dude? <laughs> I'm all ready to be fun. Bring on the fun. <laughs> Kevin, I actually, I have a question for you. So we, we mentioned Dayton at the top of the show. Dayton has been uh, watching and uh, chiming in every now and then. I, can you give us just kind of a rough idea of what the, uh, what the breakdown and the workload is like? Since you guys have collaborated so much, you know, what do you contribute? What does he contribute? Is it just very organic? How does that go? I think organic is the best way to describe it. We, it, it I, I don't like to use the word literally much, but in this case, <laughs> um, uh, every project is different. Um, if, if there was going to be a general rule of thumb, uh, we break the stories together. We actually have, that's, that's always the most fun of the project. Um, the majority of our stories have been broken at, uh, um, you know, a, a chicken wing joint, um, you know, where we'll, we'll drink iced tea, unsweet for me, sweet for him and oh. uh and and just knock out uh, story ideas um and then uh we write the pitch um more often than not i think only just a couple of times i've written the actual document that goes to uh cbs and pocket for approval and once that comes back then we will take that document and just draw lines on what we think represents a chapter it could be several pages it could be simply one line in the pitch you know i mean spock and kirk figure out how to get in you know <laughs> well there's a chapter um and then uh, uh we decide what point of view characters would be great for those chapters and there are certain characters that um we have our uh, um preferences for writing point of view uh, i absolutely defer to uh, to Dayton to uh, to write Kirk point of view. Uh, I love writing McCoy. Um, I uh, in the uh, latest book that we did, which actually is close to a couple of years old now, which was the uh, uh, the third volume in the Legacies trilogy for the 50th anniversary. Um, I wrote just about um, just about everybody who uh, wasn't one of the main cast. I think I wrote a couple of chapters from Chekhov's point of view, um, but. Uh, I was writing Sarek. I was writing Joanna McCoy. I was writing number one. Um, you know, I just, I mean, that to me is perfectly fine to let me into the heads of people that, that we might not uh, see as much as the main cast, which means there's less room for me to have to worry about getting it right. And uh, who, who cries the most between the two of you? Oh, me. Yeah. Okay. Me. Okay. Uh, that's yeah. Without question. Okay. Without question. Right. He's a former Marine, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's true. Yeah. Tough guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm uh, spongy. <laughs> I have a question for you really quickly. Um, it's because it's one of my favorite terms. So it's, it's such a, like a visceral term in a way. Uh, but for people who don't know, when you say break the story. Yes. What? Yeah. Uh, can you define um, that? Because, I mean, I think I know what you mean, but I mean, for people who know, don't, because I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a great bit of terminology for, uh, for I, what you're doing. And I truly don't know if this is where it originates, but in my head, it's just, it's just uh, short for breaking it down. Uh, we know what we would like to do at, you know, at a uh, thematic level. Um, we know what we'd like to do with, uh, you know, hey, let's have an adventure about this. But to break down the elements of the story as far as, uh, you know, what, uh, what scenes, you know, where, I mean, it's kind of, you know, the, uh, uh, somebody told me this about a comic book, which I thought was interesting was that uh, uh, to know about uh, what goes into each panel. And then when you turn the page, 
uh, you can have all sorts of stuff happen in between that page turn you don't necessarily have to see. And it's the same with any kind of storytelling. It's, it's important to know what you really need to see to, to get what's happening. It's also really important to know what you didn't need to see or hear. Um, you know, there's lots of exchanges that can happen off camera. Uh, there's been things that we have deleted, uh, you know, stuff that we've written. Okay, usually stuff that I've written um, that we end up losing because we decided, you know what? I don't know that we really need to spend time walking somebody through that because they'll probably get it if that helps. Cool. Six four six five five eight eight six five six is the phone number to call. Six four six five five eight eight six five six. Then you can enter the meeting code that you'll find in the show description and the comments, or you can join our Zoom meeting. You can do the video thing. Uh, you can also use the one tap from your smartphone. Now, the last time I said somebody called in by video phone, we did not have them. Uh, this time, I don't want to use the term video phone because I'm afraid that's what broke it. But <laughs> Earl, uh, visually, visually representing. Uh, is Earl. I hope. There, there he is. You, you, you there said, I am. Oh, my oh. goodness. Oh, look at that. And look how good the room looks, man. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. I had a, wow. a question um, as far as what the role is within the Hallmark ornaments, because it's, uh, it, you know, it's a product line where you don't always envision there being a writer involved. Now, of course, someone has to write the marketing blurbs and so on. But I was kind of wondering what his role is in that. Is he in on the conceptualization, picking out what is, you know, what's going to be the product? For Earl, I'm right here. I was going to say, don't talk about a third person. person. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I can hear you. (laughs) (laughs) In fact, don't turn around. I'm standing right behind you. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, the, my role is, uh, partly as a writer, but it's also, uh, partly as a conceptor. Um, you know, um, we, there's a team of people, um, uh, and, you know, and I, I call them friends sincerely, uh, Kurt Galke, our product development manager and Mike Brush, the, uh, keepsakes editorial director and, uh, Christine Taylor, who's our, uh, um, uh, licensing, uh, creative licensing account manager, which actually I think that's not even the right title. But anyway, there's a number of people who will sit down and come up with the ideas of what not only what we think will sell, but we, you know, which actually should be the number one thing, but that's never, I don't lead with what should sell. I lead with what I think is going to be a really great memory. Uh, it's funny, uh, John, when you're talking about uh, that, uh, you know, geek has crept onto your tree because of gifts. Well, that's actually, that's absolutely by Hallmark design. Uh, we <laughs> want somebody to, to take a look at an ornament and say, dang it, this is John. You know, this, this is something I know that he likes or it's something that connects us together. And I'm going to get that for him. And you like it enough that you put it on your tree. That means we win. You know, we did a exactly what we intended to do because you've got the story. I mean, every ornament, as they say, goes out incomplete from the factory because you add the story and that's why it belongs on your tree. And that's why we have it there. So my job is when somebody says, Hey, um, we'd like a scene from discovery. Um, and I might be the only person at the table who's seen the entire series. Um, but you know, we're going out of the gate uh, next year with a scene from discovery and what is it? What's something that's memorable? What's something that, uh, you know, you got to remember that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that said, uh, yeah, um, a, a dead Spock lying on the floor of engineering is exactly what we need on the tree. Um, right, we have to talk about that at some point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, actually, there's, there's been two or three ornaments that I came up with that have been, I don't want to say scandalous, but certainly have made people what? Um <laughs> But uh, um, yeah, that's my. But that is my role now. Um, when it comes to quote unquote writing, uh, you know, jump out of the franchise for a second. But for those people who are tuning in that are fans of Hallmark uh, ornaments, um, we have a, a new line for keepsakes uh, started last year called Start or, uh, uh, Keepsake Storytellers. And storytellers are ornaments that when uh, you plug one in, it gives you a scene from a story. If you plug a second one in, it interacts with that first one. They actually use uh, a radio frequency to seek out what ornaments are on the tree in that series. And the story expands to include all of the ornaments that are on your tree. So with Star Wars, we're ultimately going to have seven ornaments and you'll get 10 minutes of story from Star Wars. 
And I wrote that. Uh, I t- you know I took the the movie and tried to figure out how, if if I use these seven iconic ships to represent Star Wars and try to distill something about it. Um, you know, from start to finish, you know, where would you get, where, you know, what's the plot thread that was, I came up with that and, uh, um, you know, had a massive Excel spreadsheet to uh, coordinate four channels of sound in each of seven ornaments and exactly what the show would be if you had any one of those, any two, any three, any four, any five, any six, any seven. And that was a little bit of doing. Wow. And, and tell me, please, that they're going back to Kashyyyk for Life Day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have tried so hard. I've tried so hard to convince them that Life Day, you know, you know Hallmark has never invented a holiday. Um, but, uh, but Life Day, I think, is the one that we should really get behind uh, as, as a company and, uh, and make reality. They don't See, have to invent it. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. We can only promote it. So you mentioned Discovery. I'm picturing an ornament where um, uh, Mirror Universe Philippa Georgiou kicks the crap out of Laurel in the uh, in the brig. That, that's what we're waiting for, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, actually, what what happens is that uh, you know, it, uh, um, you you press the button, he falls out into you know the, the core of the ship, uh, uh-huh. and then when the performance is over, he slowly draws back up into the. <laughs> nice. It nice. really is lovely. It's nice. it's lovely. And uh, um, and and actually, uh, that, that that comes with gummy ganglia. Uh, if you buy Ooh. it on the weekend, oh, um, too soon, uh, too soon. Yeah. I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> actually, this I'm going to tell you where where we went um, with discovery. Um, it is the scene with. Uh, well, I knew that if we were going to go with a character or, or two characters. Um, to me, the uh, um, the relationship that not only is uh, interesting visually because we have to look at how this is going to look on the tree and on the wall, and interesting to me, uh, at least the one that I pitched was uh, Michael Burnham and Saru. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that uh, the connection between the two of them, um, you know, throughout the series, uh, is uh, one that uh, um, I I think it's very compelling. Uh, just when you think that one of those characters. Um, you should have no reason to uh, invest in the other. Uh, they they, they kind of come, it just kind of comes out of their core to say, I, I think I, I need to trust this person. And, uh, and it just that, so yeah, there's a lot of things I like about Discovery. That is one of them. The specific moment that we decided to capture an ornament again, because, you know, I mean, I'm all about the dark humor, uh, is uh, Saru passing uh, Captain Giorgio's um, belongings uh, in the case to Michael Burnham, and oh. uh, which was actually a portentous moment, and uh, yeah. you know, in, in that part, and it had great dialogue. And that's the other thing too, is that you know, it's kind of a uh, you know, quote unquote, multimedia experience, and uh, and we wanted some lines that just were uh, were compelling, and so that's what we went with. That's where the writer comes in. Nice, nice. Uh, Earl, anything else on your mind tonight? I well, I kind of wanted to plant the idea because I, in addition to the Star Trek ornaments, this year in particular is uh, is very expensive for me because I already had. You're a, welcome. A, a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. Hey, I got I, college loans to help pay off. Well, I already had a friend of mine at STLV pick me up. Um, oh, Eric, nice. I love nice. Um, oh, and and I will tell you, I fought for those um i wanted them for the 40th anniversary and uh, and we uh, got them for the 45th and i will t- and i'm pretty sure this is true um you know john van sitters would be the person to uh, to ask for sure in 45 years i believe we are the first company to introduce and and sell um a three-dimensional rendering of both eric's and Ress. and they're not even they're not even going on my tree because once I, because uh, I just moved. Once I get everything set up in my room, I've got it figured out that if you stand them on something about the height of a tin of Altoids or something, <laughs> they fit perfectly with the four-inch Playmates TOS figures. Wow! Uh, okay. The 90s. So wow, that's cool. That I can't take credit for that. Robert Chad was the sculptor, and uh, I'm I'm sure that between him and uh, and Kurt Galky, they were the ones who uh, wanted the dimensions. My goal was that they would potentially be compatible with our star trek legends series um but uh playmates figures i was a huge fan of those back in the day 
Yeah. So definitely thank you for fighting that good fight. Um, yeah. The, one of the reasons this year is so expensive is because uh, there's also the Donkey Kong machine ornament. <laughs> and now I, I wanted to plant the idea because several years back, you know, they did Pac-Man, they did Galaga. And yes, then yes. Tron Legacy came along and I was thinking for sure the 1982 Tron arcade machine was going to be the ornament and it wasn't. Um, there's still time to circle back for that one, by the way. But <laughs> Star Wars and Star Trek both had fairly successful arcade games in the early 80s, Star Wars especially. And so if if the numbers are ever flagging on those retro arcade machines, you just need to double down on the licenses because uh, my action figures need a Star Trek machine to play <laughs> on the bridge. Yeah. Well, bless you, sir, because those are fantastic ideas. I will tell you this as the person who uh, um, absolutely helped uh, uh, get the uh, um, uh, the Tron light cycle uh, onto the tree. Um, we went back and forth and back and forth. Just, I mean, I came, you know, I was, I was, you know, ready to go to the uh, to the Hall family and say, how can we not do a Tron cabinet ornament? Uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, um, when you say double down on licensing, you you absolutely hit the nail yeah. on the head. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we have to look at when uh, it comes to the vector graphic machines for the uh, for the Star Trek combat simulator, as well as the uh, uh, Star Wars vector graphic that uh, is still one of my favorite machines to play. You're dealing um, with Atari just, then. Yes, and there's yeah. and uh, and 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 how does Atari exist right now? I think that I think it actually has been purchased by somebody. In fact, there's 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 a, a twenty six hundred emulator cabinet that's coming out uh, through a Kickstarter. I think I saw, but uh, yeah. So that's just yeah. It's the same. You know, it's it's one of the same reasons why uh, for the longest time. Uh, um, uh, uh, products for 2001 A Space Odyssey didn't come out. Um, it just it, it got such a, a tangle of who owns what. Or, or another uh, better example even is uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, Batman 1966 uh, TV series. Why wasn't it on uh, you know uh, home video for for so long? Exactly. Um, well, I mean, between 20th Century Fox and ABC and Warner Brothers and and, and who knows what else, um, there's just it gets to be a tangle. Hey, Earl, thank you so much, man. Always good to see you. Thanks for joining in the conversation tonight. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see you next time. Nice to meet you, Earl. Good to meet you. And let's see, I believe standing patiently by, we have John on the phone. John with the unlikely name Cooley. Ah! I have no idea who that is. <laughs> What's up, John? How are you? How are you, pal? I'm Hey, okay, tell, tell, I, I paid by invoice. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Good to hear it. Thank you. My daughter will happily eat tomorrow. Um, so listen, dude, so just a couple of things to throw at you real quick. Like, <laughs> sorry, I got completely thrown off when you actually name checked me earlier. Cause I was like, damn it. I didn't want him to, to see me sneaking in the uh, back door. <laughs> yeah. That's um, uh, too bad. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. A um, couple of things. One, dude, it is a rad time to be a Trekkie from the 70s right now. I know oh, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I, indeed. The other, day, the other day, and I know that you do this too, uh, or at least I like to think that I'm not the only geek doing it, I can actually sit in my office wearing a reproduction of a 75 kids Star Trek shirt, playing with a brand new Mego that I just bought at the store the other day. Mm -hmm. uh, while Star Trek plays in the background and I dream about an animated series episode that never happened where the crew of the Enterprise meets the Harlem Globetrotters <laughs> so, <laughs> you know sir I would be on board with that if only Scatman Crothers was still here to do the voice of Metal uh, tell me about it tell me about it I mean dude I, I mean hey Waypoint comic just saying anyway um, uh, you know, hey, we, um, if uh, you know, there's uh, there's a, a one shot coming out later this year from IDW with the possibility of continued waypoints. Uh, I, I mean, you know, uh, trust me when I say that uh, Dayton and I are uh, standing ready with uh, with pitches to do that again. Dude, there you go. Just saying. Keeping all of that in mind, is there anything from that era? Like, you know, the animated series era when we were kids and we're playing landing party in the backyard. Is there anything that hasn't come back yet? You know, Marty Abrams is back with Mego. There's all sorts of stuff going on. 
like, is there something that you had when you were a kid? Because I, I can think of a couple of things for me, but is there something from back then that you're like, ah, that would be rad to see again? Well, you know, I almost got a choop. A, let's try this again. I almost chipped a tooth getting hit in the mouth by a tracer gun. So I don't care if those things ever come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, <laughs> those are savage. They were savage. That's a great question. Um, you know, the uh, I love. I really did. I got as as dumb as it sounds. I got a lump in my throat when I saw that Gorn picture you posted um, oh. of that uh, me go um, because uh, you know. In, in in my mind, uh, the uh, the Gorn, uh, you know, is supposed to look like uh, Vol in a Klingon outfit. Um, the, right. <laughs> you know, because that's basically what it was. Um, or actually, you know what? That head was from the lizard, uh, the uh, Spider-Man villain. Yeah, the Marvel lizard. lizard. Exactly. Um, yep. The uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, the, I think that. Uh, um, the toy that I had from those days that I got the most out of, um, aside from the fact that, you know, um, building the uh, AMT kit and, and holding on to the secondary hull and running as fast as I can down the sidewalk, <laughs> um, was uh, the exploration kit um, when AMT oh. did the, uh, the the phaser communicator and tricorder, um, and that uh, was something that uh, that meant a lot to me. Um, even though the, uh, my oversized hands, you know, for the for the, uh, but it was the closest to uh, screen accurate props that we had from back in the day. And a little plug for Hallmark: um, this year we have a tricorder ornament, which means that we have reproduced for the tree uh, a at least a Type One phaser or communicator and tricorder um and those things really do evoke for me that exploration set oh that's rad that's cool, cool is, me, it's the, it, oh go ahead ken what are you saying? oh no sorry i was just gonna say what's cool is you don't even have to shrink those they're trump sized oh <laughs> oh dang it <laughs> <laughs> all, I got all day without making <laughs> like i'm so sorry I do what I need. And, and look, if, if any of our friends are, are, are listening, uh, I need an enterprise bridge place that dude, I need them to redo that. Cause that when I saw the Gorn and I saw that they not only did the Gorn, but they corrected the Gorn to TOS. There was a teensy weensy part of me that had a little debate where I'm like, should Miko do it the way it was in 75 or should they update it, make it look a little more like it, like it really did on the TV screen. And I, I think splitting the difference, you just make the thing look like the animated series. Oh, that's yeah. great. You know, you nice. need it. You yeah. need it in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just <laughs> waiting for uh, um, season two discovery um, to include a Neptunian. That's that's my. <laughs> oh. <laughs> let's let's oh. let's 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 make that that thing canon for God's sakes, dude. From your mouth to the great bird's ears, dude. <laughs> that would be. So I will. I will cool tell you. That be? I will tell you both. The thing that I was most afraid of at one point was that the uh, the Kelvin timeline was going to end up with a fifty foot tall Vulcan. That said, <laughs> if, if we met if we met Caniclius Five in Discovery, I think I, oh. I mean I would I would sign up for a year of CBS All Access just for that. Uh, that John, that's the best ever. <laughs> it, 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 well, I, if only we knew some writers. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for uh, thank you very much, John, for uh, for for calling in, and uh, and you seem like an interesting fellow. I hope we get to talk again someday. Oh, you maybe, should. maybe I do have I do have one last little question for for uh, for Kevin. Hey, man. No, nope, uh, sorry. Guest, guest <laughs> no. Green guest voice on the animated series: Charles Nelson Riley or Paul Lind? Discuss. Bye. Peace. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to take that uh, be a whole off other show. later i think yeah. because uh, earlier well hold on a second because in just a moment i want to remind you of something to do in about six or seven minutes uh, our friends from priority one are going to be doing their live show so don't go anywhere after this except point your browser to wherever you go for them i think it's facebook.com slash priority one podcast uh, every week uh anthony Kenna and Elijah get together to talk about all things Star Trek. It's 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 news, it's book reviews, it's it's just all kinds of fun discussion um, that is going to take a, a t well, it's a tremendous amount of fun. You get to hear the live show today, and then Friday they actually put out the produced show. So if you miss any part of it, or if you just can't stick around for the live one tonight, uh, podcast.roddenberry.com is where you'll find that podcast. Uh, but uh, seriously, it's right after this. So just you know. 
facebook.com slash priority one podcast. And then there's this whole other crew of, of people having a bunch of live Star Trek fun. And, uh, and we would encourage you to join them. Just as we have encouraged Kim to join us, and then Kim yes. went away. And, and no, rumor, has it, rumor has it, Kim is actually back with us. Kim? Uh, yeah, I'm back. Hey, Kim is back. Hey. Welcome. Uh, yeah, it's been a while to, uh, since I've been on. Sorry, guys, but um, thank you for having Glad me Glad to on. have you here. Yeah, yeah, and thanks to having Kevin on. So, Kevin, hey, guess what? Uh, look at that. Gonna, I, I wondered uh, why my check had a bump this week. <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? I already got it, right? Thank you. So, yeah, I've, I have got every starship that has been done with Hallmark since 1991. Ah, bless my, you. Yeah, my mom and I and my daughter, we do an ornament thing. So each of us get an ornament to our daughters, basically. So she got me the 1991. I have all the starships since then. I, you know, all the other stuff, I only have like City on the Edge of Forever and maybe a That's Sulu. A I think my, I think my daughter got me the Sulu, but cool. I gotta say, I'm gonna say right now for Hallmark, this one here, oh. this Honda 7, CB750, okay? Yeah. This year, this year, I awesome, dude. Ah. I'm I'm tired of Harleys, right? <laughs> Honda, man. I'm a motorcycle person. I don't own a single Harley. I've got majority of Hondas and BMWs. So, thank you. I can tell you, yeah, as being being a kid who uh, um, uh, was scared to death of riding a, a Honda 70, but uh, a very admiring of my friend who had one across the street. Um, I, I, I hear you. We had a Harley Davidson license for, uh, uh, keepsakes for quite a while. And, uh, I, I'm, you are not alone that, uh, to see us, uh, um, uh, expand into a, a different kind of brand. And that is a great looking motorcycle. I wish I knew off the top of my head who sculpted that. I apologize that I don't, but I'm really glad you like it. Oh, oh yes, I do. And some of the Harleys that have been done, I do have them on my tree. Sure. Yeah, but not too many. But, you know, this year when I saw the 750, I'm like, oh, yeah, because I've got one of the later models in my garage, by the way. Oh, great. A few, but uh, it's like awesome. And I do have all the ships from 91 on. Well, thank you. And some of those are very hard to come by. So you've, you've, I, yes. you've got a great collection. I do. I do. And I will not part from that 91 because my mom gave that to me. I, I will tell you a quick story because I know we're betting up on time. Uh, I, when I was out of work, I had to sell my entire complete Hallmark collection, having no idea that I would end up working there, um, yeah. including my, all my Star Trek ornaments. Um, but hey, you know, mortgage got to be paid. You know, kids' lunch, uh, you know, tickets have to be bought. Um, when I was hired by Hallmark, just in passing, I was talking to a friend of mine who had uh, um, was asking me about my Star Trek connections, and, uh, and so, well, you must have all the ornaments. No, I don't. And that's why. Uh, a couple uh, a couple days later, was Becky Jake was, was her name uh, came by with a uh, a bag um, that she said, "Hey, this is for you." And I opened it up. It was the ninety one Enterprise and the ninety two shuttlecraft. Oh and, yeah, uh, I was just dumb. Yeah, I got and it. I said, "What? What?" what are you doing? You have to know what these are. She said, well, yeah, but when those were brand new and I bought them in the company store, for whatever reason, I bought two of each of those. And I had not, I had no idea why until you told me your story and I knew that these were yours. And I still choke up when I, when I talk about it, because it was a very meaningful thing for someone that I'd only known a short time. And, uh, and, and so that's, and, and that's, but that's what it's like working at Hallmark. I mean, people live that brand. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, and those two ornaments are sitting on my desk at work. I don't even take them and put them on the tree because when I look at them, I think of Becky, I don't really think of anything else, but just, but just that. And like I said, those are the stories that we attach to these ornaments that, that we hope are meaningful. Well, hey, tell your friend I'm looking for a box of about a dozen of the USS Defiant ornaments, okay? <laughs> oh, uh, man. Well, well I've, I've got one, else. but I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got well, one, but I, I'm not going to give it to I, you. I saw it for sale for $1,600. So, oh, uh, yeah, and it's still yeah. sit, 
something's only worth what the next person's going to give you for it. No one's going to yeah. give somebody 700 bucks for that ornament. Yeah. <laughs> Kim, I'm thank only, you allowed, very much for I'm calling only allowed to sell something for what I bought it for. So, uh, you know, oh. I, I, yeah. So I have one. And, That's a good uh, rule. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Kim, thank you very much for calling in. Uh, Kevin, thank you very much for being here. John, it's always a pleasure to see you. Unfortunately, yeah. uh, we're, we're right up against the end of it. Really, really is super, super fast, Kevin. If you want people to know the one place to go and find out all things Kevin Dillmore, they would go. Um, if, if they if they would like to know about me, uh, find me on Facebook. Uh, if they're okay with vulgarity, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. And that's at Kevin Dillmore, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Very cool. Thank you very much for coming on. And I hope we can Thank have you on you. again this sometime. Is a, this is a treat. I'd love to be, I'd love to join you again. Kevin, you'll absolutely have to come back. Mission Log Live is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Executive producer, Rod Roddenberry. Technical production on Mission, Mission Log Live by Infinity Networks. Producer, Brandon Bradley. Be sure to visit podcast.roddenberry.com for the latest from the Roddenberry Podcast Network, including Mission Log, Mission Log Live, Women at Warp, Priority One, and The Trek Files. Thank you to everyone who joined us live or later. We will talk to you next week.